Thank you. I'm going to introduce my, uh, the panel here, um, the esteemed panel. On my left is John Hott, who is a theologian at Georgetown who's been interested for a long time on the intersections of science and religion. Um, he is possibly the only theologian who's ever received the Friend of Darwin Award. Um, <laughs> next to him is Nancy Murphy, who's a philosopher of science at Fuller Seminary. Um, she's also interested in, in the connection between science and theology. And her most recent book is Did My Neurons Make Me Do It? Um, and to her left is Ken Miller, who's a cell biologist at Brown. Um, he is the co-author of the most widely used high school biology textbook in the country. And his most recent book is um, Only a Theory, Evolution in the Battle for America's Soul. So please welcome our panel. And let's get started. Um, this event this evening was advertised as a conversation about immortality and the soul and its connection to the self broadly. And so I just thought I would jump in with the first question, which is, do we have immortal souls? And <clears throat> are they separate entities from our bodies? Uh, John, would you like to start? Well, I, I hope so. Um, <laughs> I don't like to use the word soul without describing the context in which I'm using it. Uh, I think Nancy will agree with me that we've had too dualistic an understanding of humans, that soul is something like a spark which accidentally came from some other world and got imprisoned in matter. That's the old myth of the exiled soul, and a lot of people still have that idea of the soul. Let me just say from the point of view of my own studies of science, of evolution, and cosmology, that I like to think of it along the lines of the great Jesuit paleontologist Teilhard de Chardin, who suggested that we should think of the soul not so much as a spark that falls accidentally from some other world, but as a flame that breaks out after a long cosmic process of fermentation. One flame. There are other flames that break out, too. There are other kinds of self-subjectivity other than our own that we now recognize. But I like to think of the soul in that sense, and that ties us to the universe. So when we ask about the soul anymore, at least in the theology that I'm comfortable with, we're asking simultaneously about the destiny of the whole universe. Hmm. Nancy, you have a wonderful quiz in your book about um, what people, what everyday people actually think the soul is and where it resides in us. And, and I wonder if you could share with us the quiz and maybe invite the Am audience I going to, to get, <laughs> will, I may, will I be able to make them raise their hands? Yeah. All right. Go. Go for it. Well, here's the quiz. It's multiple choice. Uh, it, what, which of the following comes closest to your view of human nature? Human, humans are composed of, A, one part, a physical body, B, two parts, a body and a soul, or a body and a mind. C, three parts, a body, a soul, and a spirit. Uh, or again, one part, but a pure, purely spiritual substance. And I always put in some sort of um, escape question at the end, like, who cares? <laughs> and so I want you to raise your hands. How many of you would choose one part, a body? OK. Two parts, either a body and a mind or a body and a spirit, or a body and soul. Quite That's a few. How about three part, parts, body, soul, and spirit? One part, a spiritual substance? All right. And who cares? <laughs> <laughs> I usually go on then to argue that the position of the Bible is actually the last uh, option. Uh, who cares, or why are you asking this question? Uh -huh. But what do you think? Do you think that we have a soul, and if so, is it separate from our body, and what is it made of? No, awesome. I am uh, either famous or infamous, depending on uh, where I'm speaking, for denying that there is such a thing as a substantial soul. Uh, I believe it's a concept that comes, uh, it has a variety of, re of sources in various religions, in various philosophies, but I think that the ancient Hebrews were rather unique in uh, seeing themselves as psychophysical unities, 
um, uh, with an emphasis on the physicality. They're made out of the dust of the earth. Uh, and that um, dualist conceptions of human nature actually entered into Christianity sometime after the, the life of Christ and came primarily from the uh, philosophical and re religious milieu of the Mediterranean world. Okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna have another question. I'll put it on hold and ask Ken for his idea about what the soul is. Well, I, as, a, as, a, as a scientist, as a biologist, I have a really easy answer, which is the soul is generally construed to be immaterial, and science deals with matter, so I have nothing to say about it. <laughs> Cop out. But, but Cop don't, out. don't worry, don't, I, 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 know, I know I can't get away that easily. Yeah. Um, I, I can tell you, you know, I can tell you, and any biologist can tell you this, I think, I can tell you what the soul is not. Um, and what the soul is certainly not is the animation that puts the spark in life. Um, I think it's a, it's a conception that many people have, that we are animal in nature, and the soul somehow is what makes us human, which gives us the capacity for ethics, for making moral judgments, for writing poetry and music. Um, as a biologist, uh, I really don't think there's anything that goes on in our minds that is not ultimately explicable in terms of the laws of physics and chemistry and the cell biology of neural connections in the brain. Now, to many people, that means I'm reducing humanity to mere chemistry and physics. And my answer to that is, I am, but what I object to is the word mere. Uh -huh. And the reason for that is that chemistry and physics are far more marvelous than we generally allow them to be. And today, as we investigate more and more about the physical universe, we come to realize that the sort of dimensions that one thought of in a, in a, in a, in a hundred years ago in physics, that we can map out space in a Cartesian sense, that we can understand uh, matter and energy as quantities to be measured and, 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 and simply set aside, and we can say what's, what's there and what's not. These, quantity, th these conceptions have become obsolete. Um, you know, we talk about uh, existence as being composed of 10 or 11 dimensions. We talk about being trapped in a three or four dimensional universe mm -hmm. ourselves and being unable to conceive of or communicate with the existence of other universes. Um, if you went back 150 years ago and you threw these concept out to ver out concepts out to very learned people, they would sound spiritual in nature. Mm -hmm. They would sound almost mystical. Mm -hmm. And yet that's the sort of view of the physical universe that science has increasingly converged upon. Okay, but I'm, um, I'm stuck with being sort of a literal-minded person. Um, and I know that as Christians, you all have to believe that some part of yourself lives forever after you die. So what is that thing? Well, I'm not uh, opposed as a theologian to, to thinking of the soul as, at least partly, an animating principle. The, the term comes from the Latin word anima, which means soul. We get the word animal from it. Uh, I think we need to be more democratic in spreading this animating principle around to other species huh. as well. But I, I, I can't help from recalling the fact that the whole notion of the soul came into our consciousness as human beings uh, long before the scientific revolution at a time that the great Jewish philosopher uh, Hans Jonas refers to as a pan-vitalist milieu mm -hmm. where, where everything was alive, not wow. just animals and plants, but, but the whole environment uh, and, and, and stars. Even Aristotle thought there was an animating principle in stars. So the whole world was full of life. It pulsed with life. At that time, in that context, the problematic was if everything is so alive, how can anything be dead? Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. imagine yourself in, a, in a, a tribal setting and somebody in the tribe dies and there's this inert corpse lying before you. It doesn't make any sense at all. Life is the norm. Death is the unintelligible exception. And then something very interesting happened. M the modern world, science, Descartes. Descartes decided to divide matter from mind very, very severely. So you have matter over here and mind over here, which implies that matter is essentially mindless and lifeless too. But this matter, which had been divorced from mind, became the metaphysical foundation of modern science and much modern thought. So we now live in a world, and science, by discovering vast tracts of lifeless space and time, has added to this, where the assumption has been, until recently, that if everything is dead, how can anything be alive? 
And so it's very tempting to turn back to a kind of dualism in that setting and say, well, there's this principle that's separable from matter because we thought of matter as inanimate. Right. And, and then we allow a death that it goes off to some other world. Right. That's, that's very dangerous. But I think there are a lot of interesting things that have happened in contemporary science, which now allow us to maybe recover, in a way, a kind of post-critical, post-scientific pan-vitalism. And that's, in general, the discovery by astrophysics and other sciences that we live in a world, a universe, that has been pregnant with life, or at least with the material to give rise to life and mind since the first microsecond of the Big Bang. And I'm not drawing any theological consequences directly from that. I just want to point out that science itself is moving away from the idea that matter is essentially lifeless and mindless and that we live in an essentially mindless and lifeless universe. Does anybody have anything to add about the substance of the thing that lives forever if you're a Christian? Well, I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll take the bait. Okay. Right? Um, and, and, and that is, that is you know, I, I, I've been outspoken in my career on evolution as the central organizing principle of biology. And I've defended that in public and the stuff I've written. I've even defended it in courtrooms, as, as has John, incidentally, I, sh I should mention. Um, and, and, you know, I see the sort of a grand vision, it, it, and grandeur is the way that Charles Darwin put mm -hmm. it, in thinking that we are part of the fabric of life that covers everything on this beautiful planet in which we live. And I think that's an extraordinary thing. And we are part of that fabric of life. Uh, many people would say that we emerged from nature, we as a species. I prefer to say we emerged with nature, because we are part of nature, and we are part of the natural world. So what to make of the concept of the soul? Um, we're animals, but I don't think we're just animals. I think there's something absolutely unique about the human species. There are differences that we have in quality and kind compared to other organisms, even our most closely related uh, pr uh, primate, uh, primate siblings in, in the evolutionary tree. There is something genuinely different about the human species. We're the ones organizing this event. We're the ones building these buildings. We're the, one think we're the one, only ones thinking of these great questions. And to me, I see the soul as kind of a spiritual reflection of our individuality as beings. And I interpret, I think any Christian, by definition, has to be a follower of Christ. That's simply what the word ac actually means. And I regard, basically, the teachings, which are written down in the Gospels, as imperfect as they are, um, as uh, containing a promise. And it's the kind of promise that, to me, is captured in the verse where uh, Jesus is in the process of being crucified, and there's a thief on either side of him. And one thief is saying something, you know what, that most of us would say, hey, if you're so important, get me down from this cross, man. And the other one is saying, Lord, just remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus turns to him and says, this day you will be with me in paradise. I don't pretend to know what paradise is, but I do pretend that that's a promise that I think is available to each of us. Um, and to me, that a promise of being with the creator at some point is really what the essence of the soul means. Yeah. Well, I take quite a different line. Good. Uh, because I don't believe that there is a soul. There isn't some part of us that is left over after death. Uh, there have actually been two major conceptions of life after death in the West. One is the uh, concept of an immortal soul. But already beginning 200 years before Jesus' day, uh, the notion of bodily resurrection came into uh, Hebrew thinking. And so while Jesus was alive, there were three possibilities. Uh, you could be a body-soul dualist, and you could pin your hope on the immortality of, your, of the soul. Uh, you could have the older Hebraic view that when we're dead, we're just dead, and we live on in our progeny and so forth. Or the third option is that some strange transformation happens to our bodies after death, and we are, in a sense, recreated as imperishable living beings. And uh, if you just stop at Jesus' promise on the cross, uh, you haven't gotten to the good part of the story, which comes three days later, uh, where Jesus is reported to actually have been resurrected and transformed. And actually, his body is seen in all different kinds of forms by all different kinds yes. of people. Yes, and some people say that the inconsistencies of the descriptions of his resurrected body uh, that argues uh, in favor of it being mere fiction, 
But uh, if we recognize that the language we've got to describe what a person would be like after this transformation into whatever comes next in God's plans, uh, we simply don't have any adequate language for that. And the best way to uh, convey what that is going to be like is by having slightly contrasting stories to, to indicate that this is not just an apparition, it's not a ghost, uh, it's not a resuscitated corpse, but it's something genuinely new. And so my understanding of hope for the future, and I share this with Muslims, uh, with a number of Jews, and with a number of Christians, is that we will be resurrected at some future point. Uh, but that also calls for a concept of the entire creation being transformed. Because while we've got the stories of Jesus actually traipsing around on the surface of the earth after his resurrection, we know, for instance, that earth is going to get fried in four billion years. And so we can't hope to be traipsing around on earth four billion years from now, even in resurrected states. And so I believe that there are hints in scripture that say that the entire cosmos is going to be transformed in the, uh, similar to the way that Jesus' body was transformed on Easter. And so this will lead us to um, the, my neurons made me do it. So nothing we <clears throat> do or don't do actually gets us there? Um, in other words, are we all going to be in this renewed world, um, bar, having nothing to do with our actions, whether we help old ladies across the street or whether we believe in Jesus Christ or whether we give to charity? Or um, uh, Equally competent theologians uh, stand on, uh, have various positions on that. Uh, one view is called universalism, that somehow or another we all get transformed. Another view, which I find very off-putting, is that some of us get transformed, others get resurrected up, but only for punishment. That doesn't fit with any concept of God that I could possibly believe in. And the third possibility is called annihilationism, which sounds nasty, but it just means that uh, those who really choose to be with God and God's people and have been looking out for the good all of their lives, uh, they will be resurrected, transformed, and the others will simply have passed away. Ken, this is right in your... Right in your backyard, right? My neurons made me do it. Um, uh, if we are all just a mass of neurons and chemicals and mm -hmm. th things firing in our brains, then what decisions are we making? What choices are we making? Where is morality and how does that connect to our future destiny in some new renewed earth? Well, that, uh, you, ask a whole, you ask a series of interesting questions with respect to this. And, you know, as, 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 I, as, I, as I mentioned, you know, as, 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 a, as a scientist, I'm a materialist. Um, and that is, you know, what I see is that life simply emerges out of the properties of matter itself. And I think the capacity for life is built directly into matter. Um, we haven't solved, for example, the problem of how life first originated on this planet. That's not to say we don't know anything. We actually know a great deal. But I don't see any particular reason, either scientific or theological, uh, to doubt that life arose on this planet spontaneously uh, by ordinary actions of chemicals. And what we know about the prebiotic atmosphere and the prebiotic composition of the Earth supports that sort of thing. Now, the question ultimately is, you know, how do you, uh, 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 how do you emerge from the first primitive cell um, to cells that dominated this planet for most of its history? Um, it took life about two and a half billion years to figure out how to become multicellular. Um, it took another uh, seven or eight hundred million years to figure out how to build an animal. Um, and then from the first animal to us, pretty quick, as it turns out. Um, we are collections of not just the molecules that make us up, but also the cells that make up our bodies. Um, these collections have emergent properties. And what I mean by emergent properties is the hundred trillion or so cells that make up a human being together are capable of doing things that no one in their right mind would ever look at a single cell and say that cell is eventually going to do. I've never looked at a cell on an electron microscope and said, you know, that's a cell that can compose a symphony, um, or that's a cell that can hit a baseball, or do just about anything else. And I think out of these emergent <coughs> properties comes not just the ability to make moral decisions, but the ability to back basically, as an organism made up of all these different parts, to try to ask questions like, what is the truth? And why should we seek it? And ultimately, 
Um, I have always been, I have, I've always been a, a very strong proponent of the idea of free will. And many people have argued, certainly with me and with others, that if we are material beings and we're governed by ordinary physical law, there can be no such thing as, no such thing as free will, simply because we are then machines made up of molecules. And anyone who really thinks that passionately um, wasn't paying attention to physics mm. in the first two decades of the 20th century, mm. where it became very apparent that at its finest level, matter has an inherent unpredictability, which certainly doesn't explain free will, but certainly provides, uh, sort of gives the lie to the notion that any inherent mechanical system is ultimately predictable. And I don't think we are predictable. I think that capacity ultimately is what, that capacity to make choices is ultimately wired into the circuitry of our brain. And that's how we become autonomous beings. That's how we make judgments. That's how we decide to seek the truth and how we make moral decisions. I agree with you. Um, Wait, can all I just ask? Sorry, sure. I'm just going to uh, ask John to, to step well, in. Well, I, I think your question raises a, a, an issue of how do you go about talking about these issues in science and theology at all? And, and how can you make a place for both? Or can you make a place for both? When, when you ask, did my neurons, is that all that's going, going on? I think if there's going to be a meaningful conversation, you first of all have to develop a taste for what I would call layered explanation, multiplicity, multiple levels of explanation. For example, uh, if you ask me the question, why am I up here thinking right now? One answer is, well, because my neurons are connecting, the synapses are, and the neurons are firing and so forth, doing all the things that, that the uh, neuroscientist talks about. And yeah, let's push that explanation as far as possible. But I could also answer the question, I'm up here thinking because, like the rest of us, I'm trying to understand. And then at an, at an even deeper level, if I ask the question, why am I capable of thinking at all, I would have to say partly because the universe is intelligible. So you have three different answers. And the point I want to make is that they don't contradict each other. In other words, I don't say I'm up here thinking because I'm trying to understand rather than because the neurons are moving. But we live in a culture, uh, and it's influenced by scientism, not science, but scientism, which is infatuated with explanatory monism. That is, there's only one valid level of explanation. And you see a lot of this in literature that comes from um, neurosciences today. And that's not science. That's a belief. That's, you made a commitment to explanatory monism. That's not science. That's a, a, a belief system. Or in my case, I would want to make a commitment to explanatory pluralism. That's a commitment, too. Uh, my view is that you're going to have a better chance of catching the rich texture of reality if you adopt as many different levels of approach as possible. And just taking the new understanding of the material understanding of what's going on in the brain as the only way to deal with these things, it, it, you could be, end up leaving a lot of things out. Mm -hmm. Did you want to, Nancy, did you want to say something? Uh, I just wanted to comment to, uh, to Kenneth that I think the one point you're leaving out of your account is culture. Um, uh, I don't think that you have a full-fledged human being uh, unless you consider our social nature and the huge extent to which our brains are um, uh, endowed with capacities for thought, pursuit of truth, and also pursuit of morality, which then in turn uh, activates our uh, freedom to choose alternative paths, unless you pay attention to the huge um, uh, uh, endowment that we get through language and culture. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree with you yeah. more. And I think, I think an important element, um, any anthropologist would argue, an important <coughs> element in becoming human yeah. is our extraordinary capacity as a species to form coherent social groups. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and there are a lot of primates that form social groups, but we excel at it. Yeah. And you look at the, the enormous human societies that form and cohere around culture and tradition and language, and all of these things shape our development as individuals, and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm with you 100%. Good. Um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit away from the soul. When we were waiting for this session to begin, we were having a really interesting conversation in the green room, and I want to recreate it here if we can, which is um, <clears throat> a question about near-death experiences and visions of <clears throat> another world. And are they real, or are they, again, sort of neurological firings and chemical accidents? And um, what does that mean about the way we think the next world looks? Because 
in our tra in in our Western tradition, all of our visions of what heaven looks like come from these first-hand accounts. So, um, so Nancy, you were reading a book recently that talked about near-death experiences, and maybe you can tell us a little bit about what it said, and then we can go from there. Yes, I usually turn down opportunities to review books because it's hard work. But um, uh, whenever I lecture on human nature and claim that there is no soul, uh, somebody in the audience always asks me, well, what about out-of-body experiences? Or how can you have those if there isn't something besides your body that gets out, such as the soul? And so I figured I really needed to study up on the, on the topic. Uh, so I just reviewed a book by Michael Marsh called um, Out-of-Body Experiences and Near-Death Experiences, uh, Neurobiological Phenomena or Tastes of Immortality. I may not be getting the title exactly right, but I, find, I found it an overwhelmingly convincing book uh, to the effect that these experiences merely are experiences caused by assault to a person's brain and that they don't have uh, theological significance beyond that. Now, that sounds very iconoclastic and, and uh, disappointing, but uh, the author did his doctoral research on this and uh, looked at a wide body of literature and looked at the extent to which the um, uh, authors tended to cherry pick cases that supported the view that, that uh, first of all, there's a lot of uh, agreement about what happens uh, during these experiences. Uh, second, that there's a high percentage of the people who have uh, tremendous uh, moral transformations as a result of them. But uh, he makes it pretty clear that the, er that the evidence gets cherry-picked. On the other hand, his background is in medicine, and he's able to take each of the phenomena that uh, typically gets reported in an out-of-body experience, such as um, seeming to see your body from a point up at the ceiling, and he can give um, uh, a number of uh, documented cases uh, of that happening where they know exactly what's going wrong in the brain uh, that makes that the likely cause of those events. And so if you put together the um, incongruity of the, uh, the uh, reports of the experience with what our mainline theologies would expect them to experience and find a, a mismatch, on the other hand, put the experiences together with a huge body of, of uh, knowledge on neurological causes of, of uh, identical or, or similar uh, phenomena, it, it uh, makes it look about as conclusive as it could get that these are consequences of brain injury. Do either one of you want to? Well, I, I don't base my hopes for my ultimate destiny on reports like this, but um, I, I do want to be as open as I can about them. And um, I, I don't think that simply from measuring the neurological level of what's going on, uh, whether it's pathological or not, we can thereby jump to a conclusion that these are not referential. These experiences don't point to something real. That would have to be established uh, on some other basis. What I would say is that from a theological point of view, the, tradition, the great traditions of the world, not just Christian, have always maintained that one of the criteria of authenticity of any sort of reports about transcendent reality is the degree to which it has transformed your life. Uh, and that's very, very hard to measure as well. But one thing that the great teachers, whether they're Zen masters or, or Christian spiritual advisors, uh, insist upon is that there is a process. Grace does not come cheaply, nor does enlightenment come, come cheaply. You have to go through, as the medievals used to call it, a process of adequatio. You, you have to become adequate to the particular level of reality that, that you're at. Uh, even Jesus spoke about how, who are, who, who are the ones who are going to see God? The pure of heart. And who are the pure of heart? Those who have learned to become like little children. I mean, there's a process involved as a condition for being put in touch with certain dimensions of reality. So that's still a question that would still arise after you've mm -hmm. seen these reports. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I haven't read Dr. Marsh's book. I just heard about it tonight. Yeah. I, I'm going to read it because yeah. it sounds very interesting. Yeah. Um, 
never had a near-death experience. I guess that means I'm lucky. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, I've actually never talked to anyone personally who had such experiences. Of course, I've read about them, as many people have. Um, but uh, there is one thing about this that, that Nancy related from the book that I found profoundly unimpressive, and that is that there are certain drugs, anesthetics and others, that can mimic these near-death experiences. Well, that's hardly surprising. Um, I hate to keep using the word chemical, but the brain is a chemical machine. So everyone right now in this room who sees me and hears me, sees me and hears me as a result of a chemical reaction that's taking place inside the sensory system. There are chemicals we can give ourselves that make us happy. Mm. There are chemicals that will affect our brain and make us angry or anxious. Does that mean that happiness, anger, and anxiousness are not real? Well, the answer is, of course not. Right. So the very fact that you can simulate some of these by artificial means doesn't necessarily take away the authenticity. And again, I, I, don't, have, I don't have a dog in this fight. I, I'm, I, I, I'm skeptical of any near-death experience in the way that any scientist would be skeptical of it. But again, the fact that they can be replicated chemically is hardly <coughs> surprising, because just about every other sensation and every other perception can be replicated that way as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to I'm going to switch gears here and talk about um, the way that the atheist community talks about religion. The atheist slash science community talks about religion in the mainstream press because this is a conversation that seems to go on endlessly, and um, to which there is no good answer. I have never seen an atheist and a believer have rhetorical combat, and then one of them just put down their sword and go, you know what, I'm, you're right, I don't believe in God, or Jesus is Lord. Um, you know, the, the, the two sides are just so entrenched, and they, and they go at it um, um, seemingly endlessly. So the question is, what do the new atheists, and, and you know the people I'm talking about in the groups I'm talking about, what is it that they misunderstand about the way religious thought and theology and Christian philosophy works? What is it that they're not getting? I think one of the things that they're missing out is uh, how self-critical we actually are. Um, How many years did you go to school to become a theologian? You probably don't even want to tell us. Uh, uh, And uh, could I list uh, all of the major intellectual crises that the Christian tradition has, has faced over its history? You bet I can. Uh, do I see them as, se- as very severe intellectual problems? You bet I do. And so to think that um, religious people are highly gullible, uh, they, they simply haven't uh, learned as much about the history of our own self-criticism as those of us who study uh, Christianity and related religions have. Uh, but the one thing that, that they are um, getting partly right and that we really have to listen to is the extent to which religions have been implicated in violence. And uh, so here is, um, uh, an, uh, you might say, an intellectual crisis that they are rightly bringing to us. We have to ask ourselves, what have we been doing wrong over the centuries that so uh, the new atheists can be on target? Uh, not always but in many cases in accusing uh, Christians and other religionists of um, participating in evil. John? Uh, Yes, I think the one level of discussion is the moral issue. Uh, The problem with that is it's always inconclusive because no matter what side you're on, you're always going to think of a new item to add to your list of reasons for rejecting or accepting theistic views. As an academic, my approach has, has been to ask whether they're intellectually respectable. Uh, what are the intellectual foundations of the new atheism? And, it, and they're very clear. In fact, they're self-avowed. Uh, they would acknowledge this themselves. Uh, the first item is what we call scientism. And it's, an, it's a term that Richard Dawkins, for example, accepts. It's the belief that science is really the only road, reliable road, to gathering truth about the real world. From that follows scientific naturalism, which is the view that Reality consists only of that which is, in principle, available to scientific experience and ordinary experience. What they have added, which makes something uh, makes it interesting to me as somebody interested in evolution, 
is a third item, which you might call evolutionary naturalism, and that's that evolutionary biology now provides sufficient reason for why we are moral, intellectual, as well as religious. And now that we have a purely empirical uh, explanation for these things, then why do we need theology? And my, my reply is something like what I said earlier. I can go into it in great detail, but it's, it's to try to get us to think in terms of layers of explanation. I'm not competing. For example, religion, yes, at one level, uh, religion, we, we, we are religious because religion has been adaptive. It's helped our genes get on from one generation to the next, yes. But even from a secular point of view, you could also add we are religious because it gives us a sense of community and happiness and so forth. But you could also add, at least in principle, without contradicting, contradicting the scientific levels of explanation, that we are religious because we have been addressed by the infinite. And, mm. and, and I, would, I would say that the whole the milieu, from a theological point of view, the whole universe, the whole evolving universe, is infinite being, infinite truth, infinite goodness, infinite love. And this has always exercised an attractive uh, force or, or, ex, or causality, if you will, on the whole cosmic process. So that when humans come along in the process, we respond consciously, yes. And that's what soul means to me. Soul, I, I like the word soul. And soul is that <laughs> space within us which responds to uh, the, the, the mystery of being, the, the goodness that pervades everything, the unity, the coherence, the meaning, the truth, the beauty. These are what uh, philosophers and theologians traditionally call the transcendentals. They all belong together. So uh, at one level, yes, religion. Uh, you can tell the, the evolutionary story of how morality, mind, religion came along. And I want to push those explanations as far as possible. But you could also say, in general, the whole process is a response and not just pushed from behind by mechanical causation. What, what, what I think an awful lot of the new atheists get wrong, and um, I admire their writing. I admire the challenges they put to religion. Um, I don't think, um, I, I tell every Christian I know, unless you can read The God Delusion by Richard Dawkins and come away still a Christian, um, you haven't confirmed your faith. Mm. I mean, this is important stuff to read these challenges. I think Sam Harris uh, carries out a, 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 a similar service. I was very pleased a couple years ago to debate Christopher Hitchens in print and go back and forth on the issue of whether or not uh, science has made the concept, modern science has made the concept of God obsolete. And I think uh, Mr. Hitchens and I had an interesting exchange of views, which is still available on the web, and I enjoyed it a great deal. Um, it, to me, the, the stereotype of religion and religious faith as being the enemy of science, first mm -hmm. of all, displays a kind of historical ignorance mm -hmm. of the roots of Western science, which actually come from the whole tradition of Western monotheism, which <coughs> basically views man as being separate from nature and therefore gives you a kind of objective platform from which to study that nature. And that objective platform basically is what we try always imperfectly to replicate in science. Theology so was a science. The, 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 the Western... Right? The Western view of the relationship between man and nature leads directly to the emergence of Western science, upon which the New Atheists claim to base most of their critique. That's one thing. The other thing is the notion that, um, that, that, that religious faith is inalterably opposed to science because it involves accepting dogma without evidence, which is what I often hear sometimes, is first of all flies in the face of the kind of humility that I think truly religious people do show with respect to great questions. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is the sort of personal judgments it leads us to make. And the example, and we were talking about this before we came on stage, is um, uh, about a year and a half ago, President Obama nominated Francis Collins, a very distinguished geneticist, to head the National Institutes of Health. Um, Sam Harris wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times, um, uh, rather arguing with some passion the following line of, uh, of argument, which is Francis Collins is a Christian. Christians believe a lot of stupid things. No one who believes a lot of stupid things should be allowed to run the NIH. And that was the essence of the argument. The reality is that Francis, although he's an evangelical Christian, is an extraordinary scientist who brought in the Human Genome Project two years ahead of uh, schedule and about $150 million under budget. And uh, uh, the reality of that is he has proven to be an extraordinarily capable mm -hmm. administer, uh, administrator of the National Institutes of Health. 
about 40% of the members of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, the group to which pretty much all practicing scientists belong in the United States, profess some sort of belief in a supreme being. And that in itself argues simply in terms of demographics that the notion of religious faith being fundamentally antithetical to the scientific enterprise is simply wrong. Right, except that Sam has, I agree with you about Francis Collins and I wrote, also wrote a piece supporting <coughs> Francis Collins. I don't think that one's religious beliefs should be a litmus test for right. a position as the head of the federal Not the federal least of which is because the Constitution says That's that. That's right. right. <laughs> um, um, on the other hand, some staggering number of Americans don't believe in ev evolution. Right of now. course. 50, something like 50%. And as you well know, and 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 uh, and they are not believing in evolution in the name of their religious faith. For the most part, that's so. True. So Sam's argument um, that they're you know that they are waving the flag of ignorance or anti-science is is not wrong. And are you saying that they're not true Christians? No, I'm not saying that. I'm not okay. saying that at all. I'm saying okay. they're wrong about science. Uh -huh. And, and, and the reality is, it's absolutely true that the principal obstacle towards acceptance of the theory of evolution, you certainly see this in public education, these are battles I've been involved in for two decades now, um, certainly is um, a kind of fundamentalist uh, belief that the Bible should be read as a book of science um, and not just a book of spiritual revelation. Um, and that's, that's something that I actually think the early Christians um, and I put Augustine in this category, and a little bit later I put Aquinas in this category, they would not have understood. They would not mm -hmm. have understood this kind of reading. Yeah. The kind of modern fundamentalism that we see that regards the Bible as scientifically authentic had to wait for science to develop. Yeah. And it turns out it it's not a traditional belief. It's something that took hold in the United States in the 1870s and 1880s. So it's really a recent development. That's why I don't equate it with what I would regard as traditional Western monotheism. Uh, yes, if, if you if you read the New Atheists, uh, read Sam Harris's letter to the Christian Nation, for example, you'll see in him. But you you also see it in Hitchens and Dawkins and others, and, th and that's the fact that they share with the, their creationist and intelligent design adversaries an assumption that somehow, if religious literature is to have anything which, which would make us pay attention to it, it should be giving us reliable scientific information. And that's the exact same assumption the creationist has. The creationist looks at Genesis and sees a story of, of origins and places that in contact with or juxtaposition with Darwin's, said, I'll take the Bible as the true science. Well, the, the new atheists reject the Bible as true science, but they still have, as an assumption of their whole enterprise, an anticipation that if this literature, if religion, is to have any substance to it at all, as Harris puts it, it should be telling us something about the, uh, the chemical t t table, the, the, the structure of DNA, the age of the universe. But you Christians, you don't have that in the Bible, so why are you paying any attention to this? And this goes back to what I said earlier. The fundamental assumption underlying it is scientism. And scientism says take nothing on faith, but yet it takes enormous faith to embrace scientism. So there's a kind of self-subversion intellectually that's going on at the very foundation of all the new atheism that I've read. And, and it's just, frankly, not intellectually respectable, let alone religiously respectable. I have a symbolic way of, re of uh, reflecting that same comment. I put the creationists, the ID movement people, and the new atheists all on the same bookshelf together. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. yeah. It's like Aristotle. Um, we have a couple <coughs> questions from the audience. Um, if the human species had never evolved a proclivity for a spiritual faith, and all humans were always philosophical materialists, would society have developed moral and ethical codes and strictures? strictures? In other words, is spiritual faith a necessary precondition for morality? Well, I, I give a quick answer to that, and that is um, uh, atheists are some of the most moral people I know. Mm. Um, and um, I, I, you know, my own observation, because I have a lot of friends who are non-believers, is that someone in a society like ours, which is predominantly a religious society, someone who can confidently declare themselves a non-believer, has probably thought longer and harder about issues of religious faith 
than someone who casually says, I'm a Christian. In fact, studies show mm. yeah. that atheists yeah, sure. are mm. more religiously, yeah. biblically literate than many. Yeah, and, 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 and I think that's actually a condition in our society, mm -hmm. because to make that declaration in a predominantly Christian society, you've got to think pretty hard mm -hmm. before you're willing to do that. And I, I'm not sure that would, would carry in some Western European countries where disbelief is more the rule mm -hmm. than the exception. So, so of course, one could be moral. But here's, here's the question, here's an answer that relates, relates directly to the way the question was worded. Um, and that is, as John mentioned uh, a second ago, um, evolution has given us an answer as to why human beings have evolved a moral sense, as to why we cooperate in societies, and even why uh, religious traditions are there. And E.O. Wilson himself wrote about this 35 years ago in his great book on human nature. And he argued that the religious impulse, which is in all of us, enables us to cohere around myth and symbolism and ritual and therefore gave early human societies that had that impulse the ability to do things that help us to survive, to raise food, to raise children, to make war, and all the other things that human social groups do. Therefore, it has an adaptive advantage. So in, that, in answer to that question, um, I think in evolutionary sense the answer is no. And what I mean by that is the religious impulse comes part and parcel with the development of an ethical and moral sense. Mm. That's not the same thing as mm. saying you've got to be religious to be moral. Mm. But I'm saying that in an evolutionary sense, I think these things come as a package. Mm. Well, I, I would just add to that that I make a clear, a, a crisper distinction between ethics and, and religion. Uh, I think religion comes in, in in our discourse at what I would call limits of our ordinary experience. For example, when, when you're doing science, you go along to try to solve a problem, and then someday you're driving home and you say, why am I doing this? Why am I seeking truth? Um, that that's thrusts you into another kind of discourse. I'm not saying religion is the only answer to that, but, but with, with, with morality, I mean, the question arises. I mean, we spend so much of our public discourse debating whether stem cell research, for example, is moral and so forth, whether abortion is moral. And so forth. But some, sometimes you stand back and say, well, why should we be responsible at all? That's not an ethical question. That's a question that thrusts you into a worldview type question. And that comes back to the issue of materialism. Can a materialist worldview, I mean, that's the question. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt that the atheists are good moral people. The question is whether their worldview that ultimately there is no such thing as human dignity. For example, Steven Pinker wrote an essay recently saying that, that the whole idea of dignity is a stupid idea. Uh, once you, you get into that question of what is your justification for upholding the notion of human dignity, of freedom, of the inviolability of personality, my question is will a purely materialist worldview provide a rational and, and complete justification of uh, respect for, for life and for personality. And that, that's a, a long debate, which we can't get into, yeah. but that's the question that's yeah. at issue here. Um, I'm going to say you were, sort of, um, you were sort of on the brink of answering this question already, so I'm going to ask it. At what point in human history did our souls start going to heaven, our souls start going to heaven, do lobsters have souls that go to heaven? You were answering that. Um... Lord, I hope not. I really. <laughs> not, the I really not the lobster. Not the I really part, like. I'm a New Englander. I really like boiled lobster. <laughs> uh, the, um, the, 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 the the answer is I, I don't have a clue. Um, I don't have any idea. No, um, I'm. I'm not. The, the lobster part is is more of a throwaway, but the but no, the, history, I understand. the history part is, is yeah. But but, but the history question. part also gets that same answer, which is I don't have a clue. Um, and, and 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 I'll give you an example. Um, you know, I, I remember uh, a couple years ago, um, I and a couple other evolutionary biologists had decided um, we'd, we'd have been invited actually to give a lesson on evolutionary biology to a, a committee of the Catholic Conference of Bishops. So there were like six bishops there, and we were lecturing on evolutionary biology. They're all really interested in this stuff, and most of these guys were actually, uh, had some science background. A couple of them were engineers before they entered the priesthood and that sort of stuff. They read Scientific American. These are all good signs, and did this sort of stuff. And you know, at one point, um, uh, Harold Morowitz uh, from Yale and I, uh, we broke, went out for lunch, and sat down with four or five of these, these fellas. Um, and we decided we wanted to talk to them about stem cell research. So I was trying to explain 
what a blastocyst was, what an inner cell mass was, and what the motivation was for this research, um, and why I don't necessarily share their particular concerns on this issue. Um, and then I said something like, well, I know the church teaches that the soul is infused at the moment of conception. And one of the bishops grabbed my arm and said, no, we don't. And I said, what? What, have I not been paying attention? Mm. He says, what we teach is we don't know. Uh -huh. We don't have any idea. So, since we don't know, uh -huh. we Bishops choose to do err. sometimes disagree. That's right. But, <laughs> but this was the consensus. The other, the other three bishops were nodding. He's right, he's right. Uh -huh. Whoa. He says, since we teach that we don't really know, we decide to err on the side of the caution. And that might uh -huh. be a distinction without a difference. Uh -huh. But if you think very, very literally about this soul as being this spark that's fired down from heaven, um, you get into all sorts of difficulties, which is yeah. one of the reasons why I, I sort of sidestep this, and Nancy rejects the concept altogether. Yeah. So for example, identical twins, OK? Identical twins come the fertilization of a single ovum from a single sperm. They usually divide into what's called an early morula stage, which is a little cluster of cells. And then something happens, and they split into two. If the soul is infused at the moment of fertilization, <laughs> what happens when it splits? Do you split the soul? Does it go with one cluster of cells, and you got to send up there for another soul to come down? These questions get, uh, they get a little goofy. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I prefer to say, I really don't have the faintest idea. To some people in the audience, that probably means the whole idea is a ridiculous concept. To me, it means it's something that doesn't attend a simple explanation, like here's when it shows up in conception, or here's when it showed up in the evolutionary history of the human species. Um, the Buddhist philosopher Jack Kornfield has said that immortality would be the worst thing that could happen to us. He meant that only by accepting our suffering and impermanence can we find meaning. How would you respond? Would you personally like to be immortal? That also contains in it a question about does, you, does your individual self exist as you in eternity? Mm -hmm. which is well, you know, and people tell me that they would be bored with, with immortality in heaven. I, I, I tell them, well, use your imagination. You know, <laughs> but surely there's, there's <laughs> things you could come up with. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, but if any, anybody who's fallen in love, I mean, that's, that's the great paradigm of, of what we're after. And, uh, to have that somehow immortalized, I don't think I would find that boring or offensive. I, I want to be with my beloved eternally. If I truly love them and care for them, I, I, I want their fulfillment to, along with mine. So I, I, you know, but at the same time, just going back to what was just said, I, all, all these angels dancing on a pin type of, of theological discussions. Uh, m my view is that if if you don't find something inherently transformative about a theological discussion, then it's not worth talking about. I have no desire to be immortal uh, in the sense of this life carrying on and on. Um, and as I was saying before, we, we don't have it. Uh, if you <coughs> expect there to be a transformation uh, and the kingdom of God to be realized in full, we don't have any clear ideas. Uh, Jesus used the image of a, of a wedding banquet quite often to refer to the next life. And so there are a few things that we, I think we can say for sure. It's going to be social. Uh, we can't answer the question whether we're actually going to be drinking wine or not. Uh, but one of the things that's given me a glimmer of uh, you know, a way of imagining why I would like it to go on and on is we have conversations like this. Uh, we start a topic. We branch, we branch, we branch. And in this life, we never have time to go back and finish up everything we wanted to say to one another on those topics. And so the idea that um, the kingdom of God allows for um, ongoing conversation with interesting people uh, discussing significant ideas, and we never have to quit at a prescribed hour. That right. sounds pretty That's good right. to me. That's right. Um, belief in resurrection in America is growing very, very, I mean, sorry, reincarnation is growing very, very fast. Um, and belief in resurrection is falling. And I wrote a story about this because Americans tend to sentimentalize what reincarnation means. You know, life is really great. We can go to the supermarket and buy whatever we want. We can have dinner with our intelligent friends and drink a lot of wine. And so we just want to come back and do that again. But of course, as the person who wrote this question wrote, in real, in real Buddhism and Hinduism, reincarnation is 
terrible, and the whole point mm -hmm. is to get out of it. Yeah. Um, it's a cycle. It's a terrible cycle, and it's so uniquely American, I think, that we, you know, we just want more of what we've got. It's mm -hmm. it's. You might come back as the lobster. <laughs> 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 Do we have time for one more question? Okay. Um, oh, th this is a good. One. Um, as a scientist, I value experiment, re repeatability, and evidence. Is there any evidence or repeatable experiment de demonstrating the existence of what you call a soul? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Can I respond? Yeah. Well, I, I think when you're talking about evidence and religion and science, you have to distinguish uh, between two different kinds of evidence. Science operates according to what, what you might call spectator evidence. It's the kind of evidence that you can share publicly. It comes rather easily. The same thing happened in Japan as it happened in the United States, if you look under the same, with the same experimental conditions and so forth. It, it involves a kind of a sense of control or an objectification of, of the subject. But in, when you're talking about soul or any religious idea, you're, you're talking about something that uh, I call transformative evidence, that you, we really are not in a position to declare whether it's there or not unless we have risked ourselves on this journey. Great theologian Paul Tillich says in, in religion, there's no truth without the way to the truth. There's no depth without the way to depth. It involves some sacrifice and perhaps some suffering as well. Uh, and that can put people into a position where they are adequate, to use the term I used earlier, to say something. That other people who have not gone by that journey uh, are, are not are not competent really to talk about. Uh, so I think you have to, and the evidence is not so much that of grasping, but the evidence of being grasped by. And I know many people can testify to that experience as the most real thing in their lives. And let me, let me expand on what I just said when I said not that I'm aware of. Uh, I'm reminded of the story of someone looking for their car keys, which they've lost, and they're crawling all around the house, and they tell a friend, "I can't find them." And the friend says, but you haven't looked over there, and you haven't looked over there, and you haven't looked in that room. Mm -hmm. And the person says, well, it's dark in there, yeah. so I can't see anything. Yeah. That's what asking for scientific evidence of the soul is like. Because science can <coughs> see in certain places. Science mm -hmm. is the only tool we have to answer questions about the material and physical universe. But by definition, the soul isn't physical, and the soul isn't material. And it's a, an error of category to expect science to provide evidence for it in the same way, basically, that there are dark places in the room that you can't see. Right. But that doesn't mean your keys aren't there. I think this is a good place to stop because we started with the soul and we're, we <laughs> ended with the soul. I want to thank John and Nancy and Ken all for being here and for you all coming out on this terrible night. <laughs>